Thank you that you've revealed yourself to us. Will you now come by the power of your Holy Spirit? Will you lead us to your throne of grace that we might find help in our time of need? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Does anybody know next to the Bible and, and all the works of, of William Shakespeare what the, the best selling author is? Who the best selling author is? Agatha Christie. I bet uh, yeah, some of you knew that. I saw some uh, hands up there. Uh, you know, those who uh, might not know Agatha Christie, she was a, a master writer of suspense. Uh, really a good one, too. Uh, one of the best novels I think that she wrote, and one that's been uh, redone, and I think it's uh, been you know made to screen and for plays and all those things. Is and then there was none. Uh, if you haven't read it, that's a, a great one where there's ten guests who were all lured or invited to this uh, this island to a, a, a rich mansion. Uh, and over dinner one night, as they're gathering. Uh, a record begins to play, and a voice accuses all of them of uh, holding a guilty secret. And of course, they're all in shock looking around. Uh, and so the suspense begins, uh, and then of course, as one of the ten is murdered, and then uh, it's made known that the killer is among them, and that the killer is going to strike again. Uh, and so it's a great uh, suspense kind of thriller that Agatha Christie uh, wrote. And if you haven't read it, you probably should, uh, because it's so suspenseful. But yet, I do understand that not everyone is able to kind of take that kind of suspense. Uh, my mom, in fact, uh, she's of the type that uh, she always reads the last chapter uh, of the book first, uh, just to decide whether she's going to be able to handle reading uh, the rest of it. Uh, she's not here today, so I <laughs> For the most part, uh, we don't like suspense. Not when it comes to our own lives. I think we may like to read some uh, suspense novels, but uh, we don't like suspense in our own lives. Because suspense, what it does is it generates a, a great deal of anxiety in us. Uh, because it produces a, a feeling of uncertainty about what's going to happen in the future. So it makes it such a great uh, literary genre, but not so great when it comes to our own, our daily lives. In our heart of hearts, uh, we do not like uncertainty when it comes to uh, what the future is going to hold for us. Uh, and in fact, that sense of uncertainty about our future, all it does is produce stress and anxiety uh, that's often too much for us to bear. But let's face it, we live in an anxious world. We're anxious people. Uh, we worry about what's going to happen in our lives, about our country, about our economy, about our retirements, about our families, about our jobs, about our health. You name it, uh, we feel anxiety and stress about it when it comes to what's going to happen in the future. Uh, a woman named Ruth Whitman, who is a, a British woman who moved to America, uh, she had a, got a sense of this anxiety that, that was happening of what she could observe. And so she wrote uh, a book about it, uh, and it's titled America the Anxious, How Our Pursuit of Happiness is Creating uh, a Nation of Nervous Wrecks. There's some truth to that, isn't there? Uh, the main point being that, that for her, that our belief in, in our right to be happy has us all tied up in knots. Uh, anxiety ridden because the truth is the future is uncertain we can't predict it we can't control it and the result is stress and anxiety that in her estimation is killing us uh, and that may very well be true does this ring true for you this sense of anxiety this restlessness this stress about uh, about an uncertain future I mean, I know it does for me if I stop and think about it for too long. Uh, and I don't believe this is actually only a problem for Americans. Uh, I'll leave it to a Brit or someone to come over and say it's our problem. Uh, it's not, not just our problem. I believe this is a universal problem for all people. Because deep in our hearts, uh, we have this sense of this need and this want for control. Uh, because we mistakenly believe... 
uh, that if we can control our future outcomes, then, then life will be certain. And all of our anxiety and all of our stress will then be relieved and, uh, and we'll know nothing but peace and happiness for the rest of our lives. Or uh, we believe that if we could just read the last chapter of our lives, maybe then the suspense would be removed and then we might be content with, uh, with our present. Uh, this isn't anything new. This goes all the way back to the garden, back to the very beginning. The sin, the sin that dwells in all of us. Adam and Eve wanted to be like God, which means they wanted to control the outcome. They wanted to know the future was certain, and it was a future that they wanted. Uh, it's what they desired in their own hearts. See, what we really need is confidence and security in life. Uh, confidence to know that no matter what the future brings, good or bad, that we're secure in our lives and all is well. And that, I believe, is at the very heart of our gospel reading this morning from John chapter 10, verses 22 through 30. And so I want to invite you to either open up your bulletins and, and turn to uh, our gospel reading, or if you want to open up your Bibles and follow along, you may do so. Uh, this section... Uh, that we have our, our gospel reading from this morning as part of the Good Shepherd narrative where Jesus has revealed himself as being the Good Shepherd. Uh, and he certainly has run into opposition uh, from uh, the Jewish community around him. Uh, much opposition when he says these kind of I am sayings of what he, who he's claiming to be. Uh, but we're told in verse 22 that the events of this passage took place during the Jewish feast of the dedication in Jerusalem. Now, this is important because this sets the stage uh, for what Jesus is doing here and how he's interacting with the people and the question that he's asked and how he answers it. In some sense, it's all wrapped up in the context uh, of what's going on at that moment that everyone's there for the feast of the dedication. And for those who may not be familiar with the feast of the dedication, it's what we know today as Hanukkah. And so it was in winter, we're told, and the feast was a, was a celebration of the miracle that God had done in the temple uh, after it had been cleansed and rededicated to God after the, the Maccabean revolt. You see, the, all of Judea was at the time occupied uh, by the Greek kings uh, of Damascus and the people. Uh, the temple was occupied and in fact it had even been desecrated. Uh, in some awful ways, and the people of God weren't allowed to, to worship God uh, in the temple. And yet through the Maccabees and, and that the revolt, the temple had been retaken by force, and the temple had been cleansed and then rededicated to God. And the miracle that was celebrated in the dedication was that uh, there was only enough oil left in the temple uh, to let the, the flame of God, the eternal flame of God, burn for one day. But the, the Maccabees decided to go ahead uh, and light that flame again of God that it might burn brightly in his temple. Uh, and, the t and the burning, the oil lasted for eight days. Uh, the fact that the events of this passage happened during this feast, remembering that dedication and that great miracle, it's really important. Uh, this is why John makes sure to tell us that this is, uh, this is the context of which this, uh, this passage takes place. And the reason it's important is because even though the temple had been taken back and worship in Jerusalem had been restored, the fact remained that all of Israel was still occupied. The Romans controlled the country and the Jewish people. And because of that, there was a great sense of angst among the people. The future was uncertain. Anxieties were high. What would become of them? What would happen to all of God's promises that he had made to his people? Uh, that they would be a great nation, a light to the world? The bottom line is people were worried. The future was uncertain. What they were looking for was hope. They were looking for some sort of security, some sort of certainty about the future. I think we can relate to where they were at. I think we can relate to them. Uh, anyone feeling anxiety about the future of our country? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, surely. Uh, anyone feeling uncertainty about your own life? 
maybe uh, will the money last? Maybe will our health hold up? The human heart hasn't changed. We still want control of the future. We want to know what exactly is going to happen to us. And when we don't, the result is this great sense of anxiety and fear and stress in our hearts. And so it's not surprising then uh, that at this time, a few Jews were told, uh, who had been gathered around Jesus as he was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon uh, at the time of the Feast of Dedication, they had two questions for him. Two questions they came to Jesus with. Uh, and they were told these questions in verse 24. How long will you keep us in suspense, they asked. If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. These questions that they ask are fraught with worry and anxiety and fear. The first question, how long will you keep us in suspense? Literally, that word for suspense means uh, is the same word that's used for souls, for our soul. And so the idea is, how long are you going to keep our souls? We're all bound up in this moment. We don't know what's going to happen. We're, we're, we don't know what's going to happen with our lives. They want to understand uh, that their, their futures are in question. They want to know what will become of them. And then again, for them, it goes back to the Roman occupation. They want to know that if Jesus is the Christ, meaning the Messiah, the anointed one, uh, based on their understanding of who the Christ was, should be, they want to know if Jesus is going to secure their future uh, by leading a rebellion, one that would be greater than what the Maccabees did, one that would be a final rebellion that would cast off Roman occupation uh, and would again secure Israel as a free nation, as a national power once and for all. They want Jesus to tell them plainly. They want him to tell them plainly. Now, the word for plainly here, is, it, it means confidence. And so what they're saying is we want to have confidence in our lives about what's ahead. Uh, we want to have confidence in security in our future. So just tell us. Now, at the heart of it, what they want and what we all want and what every person from the very beginning of time has ever wanted is confidence and security for our lives and for our futures. And so Jesus goes on to tell them how they can find it and to tell them uh, why it is that they don't already have it in their lives. And this is how he answered them in verse beginning of verse 25. Jesus said, I told you. And you don't believe me. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness, but you do not believe me. So the simple answer to the question is, uh, the question being, if Jesus is the Christ, is yes. The answer is yes. Uh, but to what Jesus is saying is, I told you over and over again, many times. And in fact, in John's Gospel, Jesus has said it many times. And he said it in many different ways, using different analogies. Uh, and in addition... Jesus has done many great works to show that he is, in fact, the Christ. He did the miracle in Cana, turning the water into wine. He's already healed the official son in Capernaum. Uh, he's healed the sick man at the pool of the Sheep's Gate, just outside of Jerusalem. He's fed the 5,000. Jesus has even walked on water, for goodness sakes. He's done great things to demonstrate who he is. Yet, despite who Jesus said he was, and despite the mighty works that he's done, there was one problem. These Jews who were being held in suspense and want some confidence in life, where Jesus tells them and tells us they did not believe. They didn't believe. The word here means more than just some cognitive understanding of something to be true. Uh, it's also the same word that's translated as faith. Or trust. And so the point Jesus is making about them is this that they lack confidence and security about their lives because their faith or their trust has been misplaced. It's been misplaced. Their trust is in a preferred future of their own making and their own image, the things that they want and desire. Uh, they want to know that things are going to work out the way that they want them to. 
And that Jesus will be able to secure that kind of future for them. But the true confidence and security in life isn't found in a particular future that we have in mind for ourselves. Jesus is telling them that true confidence and security is found in Him alone. Verse 26, Jesus says, You do not believe because you are not among my sheep. You do not believe because you are not among my sheep. See, those, those who have confidence and security put their trust in Jesus alone, not in some image of what the future should look like or what you want it to look like. You know, we do the same thing all the time. When things don't go the way that we want them to, we doubt that Jesus is for real. When the world doesn't live up to our expectations of what we think it should be, we doubt that Jesus is for real. But the confidence and security, those things are not found in our preferred future or our desires for what we think it should look like. They're found in the person of Christ and in Him alone. Listen to what Jesus says about those who put their trust in Him, in Him alone. What He does is He calls them sheep. Now remember this is part of the greater uh, section of Jesus declaring that He is the Good Shepherd. Uh, but he compares them to sheep here, those who trust in him. And there's very, there's a lot of intentionality in that because sheep are completely uh, and totally dependent upon the shepherd. They're dependent for their life, for their safety, for their well-being. And this is what Jesus says. He says in verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. There's three characteristics that Jesus gives us. Right there about those who put their trust in Him and Him alone. Number one, they hear the voice of Jesus. They hear His voice. Romans 10, verse 17, the Apostle Paul wrote, So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. Faith comes through His Word. Jesus' words bear the fruit of faith in those who are able to hear them, meaning trust them. We live in a world full of voices who are all talking to us, who are all asking us to trust them. Uh, the voices within us, telling us to do what feels right, follow our own desires and our own wishes, seek our own pleasures, and if we do, everything will work out the way that we want them to. Our futures will behold that which we are desire. Then there's the voices from outside of us, telling us that we'll only buy this product or follow the, their, these particular ideas that we'll find the confidence and security in life that we so desperately long for. But those who trust in Jesus hear His voice. And as they hear His voice, they find confidence and security in Him alone. The second characteristic of a sheep, those who put their trust in Jesus, uh, is this. Jesus says they are known by Him. Now, this is confusing, I think, to a lot of us because uh, the word that's used here uh, as translated is know. It means much more than just to know something exists or know something to be true. The word is, uh, that's translated from the gr Greek, it means something deeply personal. Uh, there's an experiential nature to it. And so what this means is that, uh, that to know someone is to be in relationship with them. Not just to know them to be true, but to know them personally, to know them deeply, to have a, a heartfelt connection with them. Yet yes, Jesus, the truth is Jesus knows every person. Uh, for He has been at work in all of creation. But knowing someone exists and being in personal relationship with them are two very very different things. And the know that Jesus is talking about here is that know deeply in a personal, loving relationship. You see, to be known by Jesus is to be loved by Him. Jesus told us there's no greater love than this, that someone would lay down their life for their friends. Jesus loves us so much that He laid down His life on the cross for us. To be known by Jesus is to be healed by His love. See, Jesus' loving sacrifice has brought us the ultimate healing. Our sins have been forgiven. We have been washed clean. To be known by Jesus is to have Him present in your life daily. Jesus promised us that He will never leave us 
or forsake us. To be known by Jesus is to share our lives with him forever. When we trust him, Jesus said, he and the Father will come and that they will make their home in us. That's what it means to be known by Jesus, to be intimately, personally connected with him. Those who put their trust in him are known by him in a deeply personal way. Finally, number three, the third characteristic of those who put their trust in Jesus. Uh, Jesus says those who put their trust in him follow him with their lives. To follow Jesus means to be his disciple. To live our lives according to his truth, according to his grace. Jesus has revealed to us how we are to live our lives. When we trust him and listen to him and obey him. And the promise is when we follow him, even when things are difficult, even when the future doesn't look like we had hoped it would look, he'll lead us beside still waters as he promised as the good shepherd in Psalm 23. And his peace will surpass all understanding, even in the midst of difficult times. For those who trust in him alone, listening to his voice, being known by him, and following where he leads, Jesus then promises this. Now listen carefully because it is here what we want most. It's here what those Jews were desperately meaning when they said, tell us plainly. Don't keep us in suspense. This is what their hearts were craving. Jesus said, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. How's that for security? <laughs> Eternal life, never perishing, and forever in relationship with God and through Jesus. In other words, your ideal future may fall apart before you. Uh, you may lose your job. Your health may fail. Your family may become a source of pain and disappointment. Your nest egg may dry up. Uh, the economy may take a major downturn. Our country may morally fail beyond repair. And yet, despite it all, your future, when you are in Christ, is never in death. It's secure and it's certain. All because of Jesus and what he has accomplished on our behalf. Friends, we live in a world of anxiety, of insecurity, of uncertainty. But when we are in Christ, trusting in him and him alone, we have confidence in who he is. And ultimate security and where we are heading. You know, I think that the fairly obvious question for us today, as, as we think about these words that Jesus has said to us and how they apply, are we finding ourselves anxious about what's happening in our lives? Are we finding ourselves stressed out uh, about the future, whether it's for ourselves, our families, for our country? There's a reason for that. Our hearts long for security and for confidence. But there's only one place to find it. By listening to the voice of Christ. By being known in a loving relationship with Him. And following Him down the path that leads to still waters. Still waters of His peace. Friends, in Him and in Him alone, we are secure. Jesus, thank you for this good news. We too, just like the Jews who wanted to, who were in suspense and who wanted you just to tell them plainly, we too want security, we want confidence about our future, about our well-being. But the truth is, as we hear in your word, that the only confidence, the only certainty to be found is in you, Jesus, and in you alone. Thank you that you love us so much that you came into this world to save us. Will you take our restless, our anxious, our stressful hearts that want to take control, that want the future to look like what we desire and want for ourselves, will you help us to lay those things down and to instead seek you 
listen to your voice, follow you, and be known by your love and grace and mercy. And in so doing, find that peace that our hearts so desperately, the certainty and the confidence that we long for. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you please stand?